data from UNAIDS, obviously we see in this 15 to 19 age band that coverage of art is not, you know, where we need it to be. Um, I have seen some more cascades, and I know Sinead said that they're working on doing a cascade. Again, a call to get some of the cascade data out from the region because this is sort of, and I know there was the cascade presented from India, but from, from the region there really isn't in the published literature at the moment. Um, cascade data available. So this is from um, the U.S. and only from, I mean, from 2014. So there's definitely a need for us to better understand what the cascade looks like. I think we, we all know from our experiences what we talked about earlier that, you know, we see this drop off between testing and linkage um, and, you know, and it goes down from there. So that's whoop, the challenge, right? And I think we've been talking about this. I guess the, the good thing is that we're all saying the same thing. So I'm really encouraged and I hope that that's one of the takeaways is that we're all on the same page, um, you know, acknowledging um, the developmental trajectory of adolescence that we really need to be thinking about that in our programs. And I know that that is really challenging when you're in um, a constrained resource environment. When I think about the clinics up in Bushbuck Ridge, you know, I feel like I go to these adolescent conference and there's adolescent medicine specialists talking about their, well, either even the adolescent clinic that, that you guys have either in Joburg or Cape Town. Um, and I'm like, these adolescents are walking into a public sector clinic. There is no, you know, it's a nurse and she's seeing everybody and there's no specialized care. There's no pediatrician. There's no adolescent medicine person. So I feel like just really keeping that in mind, can, can we, Think, can we really think about differentiated care in that kind of context? Um, I, I would. I think we need to challenge ourselves about that. We've talked about the the challenges um, in in what happens in adolescence in terms of the developmental changes, um, and then these changes in context. And I think really thinking about how these changes in context affect linkage and adherence, particularly when. So I've focused a lot on. Um, on prevention and thinking about, you know, where we see incidents take off in young people, and it really is at this point where they're leaving school, where they're leaving home, um, where they're entering first serious relationships, maybe having a first pregnancy, experimenting with alcohol and drug use. Um, so I think that that also is important when we think about care and treatment. Um, and, you know, it's funny because I think we talk about, I, I liked Sinead's presentation yesterday because the idea of that we problematize risk taking, but thinking that it's really, that's actually a really important part of adolescents becoming independent. Um, and this idea, I think, in this transitioning to independent care for young people, that they need to learn to take their meds on their own. But it's also, we've been saying, not black and white. You can't just say, here, here are your drugs, go away and make no mistakes, right? There needs to be, um, I want a parent or guardian or someone who's there, it may not be a parent guardian, it may be another mentor or peer, who's there to back them up when they make mistakes because they're gonna make mistakes. That's part of learning to become an independent adult, right? And we need to recognize that when they mess up, that's the nor that's normal and we need to be able to support them um, and peers being important. So I've been showing this slide for a lot of years <laughs> and I, that's, I'm really encouraged to hear everyone talking about the socio-ecological perspective. We're really good. Um, in public health, even though we're supposed to be broader, but certainly in, behavior, in HIV prevention and I think in care, in thinking about the young person or the person in the middle, our interventions, you know, use a condom, take your drugs, um, don't think about these other levels of influence. And I think we really, 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 really need to do it because we're all saying it now, which is good, <laughs> but we really need to do it. We need to engage the partners, the family, the community, and society to really have success. Um, I know you guys can't read this, but actually, so there's a lot of new data in the last few years. So this is um, from an article from Fields from 2017. Um, and certainly here they're talking about macro level factors that affect um, adherence, but I think takeaways, which we've heard, are thinking about what might be different for our perinatally infected kids versus behaviorally infected youth. Um, so for example, I think um, family um, conflict is something that came up in this study. Caregiver youth is diagnosed based on um, past art experience. Um, I can't even read it. Life course experience of being um, 
different from their peers. So I think just the thinking about for kids who've been living with this disease their whole life, there are different challenges that they may face when they've been gotten to the age of 16 and have been taking drugs for 16 years, you know, versus a kid who just got diagnosed, their family may not know, they don't have experience with medication. Um, so thinking about what's different there, and then thinking about sort of at the individual level what might be going on, mental health, um, non-disclosure, privacy, and all of that leads to thinking about actual adherence. So as I said, I, and actually there's people sitting in this room whose this research <laughs> is from now, so I think that's really exciting. But again, like I said, some of the things that come out from um, the literature that we need to address in our interventions for pediatric kids, things like reactants, right? We hear about, you know, they don't want to take their medication that kind of rebellion we hear about, and there actually are interesting interventions from chronic disease, from diabetes, and other adolescent interventions about how you can work with parents and young people to overcome resistance to wanting to take medication. Obviously, the treatment fatigue issues, transitions to auton autonomous care, um, and denial and anger about, um, you know, being sick <laughs> their whole life um, and still having to take art. I think this feeling in adolescence of, like, this has been happening my whole life. I'm tired of it. I want it to be over. So those are sort of unique things we need to be thinking about in interventions. And for behavioral, the fact that, it, you know, they're coping with a new diagnosis, that this, this is, you know, can be a very, like, significant change. Um, so there's a lot of things from the literature that have come out. These are all actually from the region, studies that have been done now in the region, which I think is really exciting. Um, and I think things that are unique to adolescents, right? And I think something we've all heard, a big thing with this is not wanting to be different from your peers. So I may not want to take my meds or go to the clinic because I just want to be a normal teenager. <laughs> like, I don't want to have to be sick. I don't want to have to go to the clinic. I don't want to have to take these meds every day. Um, and that same thing, adherence interferes with their normative behavior. So people were talking about this. So some of the things that came up, I want to go to a sleepover at my friend's house. Like, I don't want to take my drugs with me. I don't want to have to think about taking the drugs while I'm out with my friends. You know, it's interfering with getting to just be a kid. Um, the same thing, that you've got to think about coordination of activities. And I don't know, for parents of young people, if you're driving them around to all sports practices or they're going to things after school, they're going to their friends, it's just a lot going on. And, and I think organizational skills <laughs> that we're learning as you become independent, right, comes out as remembering. Um, forgetfulness, I put that as unique to adolescents, but I think we're <laughs> that's probably not. We're all forgetful. Um, poor risk perception, this came up yesterday, right? Just this myopia that the thought of like, if I don't take my drugs today, um, I forget who talked about this, but I'm still fine, right? So why does it matter, you know, if, I, if I'm not really adherent and that those consequences may only be felt much further down the road? Um, yeah, and travel. So again, moving around. So I think those are things that are, so some of them are a little bit more unique to adolescents. And then the universal things that we see for people, I think irrespective of whether you're an adolescent or not, right? So aversion to side effects, that the medication reminds them of their illness, stigma, food insecurity, alcohol, depression, poor treatment, self-efficacy, violence at home, social support, and complex regimens. So this has all been, like, this is all evidence from studies done in the region of what people um, who have struggled with adherence talk about as challenges. And so a lot of what I do in my, in my research world is trying to think about structural and social factors. Um, and we talk about stigma a lot, um, and I think we can't forget key populations. I know it's been mentioned, but particularly for adolescents, another call for more tailored interventions for key populations in the region, because that's also an area where I feel like we really don't have good evidence at all, you know, at all for key pops. Um, and so while we there are not a lot of evidence-based stigma interventions that have shown an impact on treatment outcomes. So again, if people are doing this work, please, please, a call to like donors and, and um, program folks to be trying to document if you're working on stigma interventions to, to, to document impact on outcomes. Um, we've talked about the legal and policy barriers, but again, I think this is an area that Helen was saying earlier out of this meeting, I think we need to be really clear for government recommendations about what do we want to see about age limits for testing. You know, in a lot of settings, you can't test on your own beneath, you know, 16 or 18. Um, criminalization of sexual identity, obviously, and lack of access. We've talked a lot about that. 
And I think also what's come up, but I think importantly, you know, food insecurity has there. So there's this is a nice this is a um, a meta analysis that was actually done showing that food insecurity has been documented now as an, an important barrier to art adherence, um, and that food assistance strategies do seem to show be effective in improving adherence. So I think that that's encouraging that there's an evidence base there. The same from a systematic review of 152 studies on housing. That lack of stable, secure, adequate housing is a significant barrier to care. So I was actually really shocked when there were 152 studies. I mean, that's global. But still, I think like the evidence is there. Again, we shouldn't be questioning, like, oh, is how the, I, I feel people often say these things are too upstream. Again, right? It's not HIV. We don't need to deal with it. But we need to be working across sectors to say this is really important. And I really feel passionately that if we don't try and address these with folks in the appropriate government departments and with other groups that are working on this, I just don't know if we're going to get there, you know? And it has so many downstream benefits. It's not just HIV where we're going to see the benefit. Okay, so what does the evidence say about what works in, in teenagers? Um, so this was a review that Ravea Miko and colleagues did in 2016. So in the published literature, there's still, there's 10 studies that they identified. So I think that there has been a, like an upswing, and I know that the NIH and others have been funding, like since sort of 2014, 15, a lot of studies, and you guys have been talking about studies that are in the field. So I hope in two years, maybe at, at in Amsterdam, we'll get, there'll be more evidence here. But um, most of these that exist are small. Many of them are pilots. Um, and the, still, the vast majority have been done in the U.S., which I think, again, is a little bit depressing. But what we know works, you know, not surprising. One size doesn't fit all. Patient-centered care is important. And I think this thing that everyone's talking about, what is going on in the young person's life? Like, you re we really need to be getting providers to try and ask about this. Depression, substance abuse, violence, instability in the home situation, lack of social support, lack of privacy, food insecurity, boarding school. Like, what what is happening in their lives and how, what do we do about it? I mean, we were talking, okay, so you identify depression. I mean, I know in Malawi at UNC Project where we work, there's, there are no, there are very few resources that we can refer people to. In Bushbuck Ridge, I mean, we refer people to the social worker, but there's very little that they can do either. So I think really thinking about what we can do. So they, they tiered the interventions. There were three with level one data, so good data. I think what's interesting is these interventions all targeted non-adherent youth, okay? So I think um, the point, I think, that Lee made about the fact that most, like, there are a lot of adolescents who are doing a great job, but I think this is maybe good news for our interventions from a cost perspective, that we don't need to be blanket giving these interventions to everyone who comes into the clinic. We need to be identifying who's struggling and then targeting these interventions to those young people. So, so if they do target non-adherent youth, they include some aspect of problem solving, so involving some skills, and they do involve family and patient counseling um, to target skill building. So you'll see from the data that actually all of the evidence based so far in the literature involves family. <laughs> so which is interesting thinking about the developmental trajectory. And then for level two interventions, again, they target non-adherent youth. And here, a, a lot of the evidence is around text reminders. So text reminders work. I know that that's not everything, but we, as a minimum, right? If kids like have phones, we should be doing that, it seems like. Um, South Africa has some nice stuff. So this is family interventions. So they're interventions to improve parent-child communication using cognitive behavioral therapy. And I know that sounds scary or really complicated, but it's not. And I, I know Sinead has, will talk about it, and Sybil Hosek, who works a lot of the interventions and adherence interventions that we are using in the region are based in cognitive behavioral therapy and don't need to be implemented by like someone with a master's degree in psychology. They can be implemented if they're with lay counselors if they're trained properly. Um, so here, this idea of miscarried helping, I thought was interesting. So it's this, I, this is the idea of like parents being like, take your drugs, I need, you need to take your drugs, let me help you, you forgot, and the adolescent being like, resistant and ignoring their parent and then not taking their drugs. So this intervention actually tried to address this mismatch desired and support between caregivers and young people. Um, and they use this like family systems therapy and it's been used for adolescents in diabetes and shown to improve and reduce 
this idea. So I think, again, this is an idea where we have these challenges to look to other chronic diseases with, with young people and trying to implement some of these strategies. Um, another intervention called Life Steps is um, based on adult CBT. Um, so actually, this is the adult counseling model that Steve Safran and other folks, if you know them, have done. So they define problems impacting adherence, they generate alternative solutions, make decisions about alternatives, and then they collaborately decide on a plan. So they then um, adapted it for adolescents. It's called Positive Steps. There are 11 steps. It's five one-hour sessions. And another thing I feel like we need to get away from is this, like, oh my god, we can't do multi-session interventions because I think we can. <laughs> and kids are coming to these clubs. You guys are all talking about these peer groups that are happening. So I think we can do these things. And I would rather see us do using evidence-based interventions in these clubs than people just getting together and talking about their feelings. Not that we shouldn't be doing that, too. But we, I think we can do this stuff. So they address adherence barriers, um, models on managing moods, social life, privacy, and disclosure, and independent care. Um, and they have lots of, of different pieces in it that talk about self-monitoring, medication reminders. Um, and I think the evidence also shows, which we all are talking about combination prevention, we can't just have one thing. And they don't have to be complicated, but you do need a couple of different components in a package to see, to see effectiveness. This is a South African intervention called VUCA. Um, and it's done, been done with younger adolescents, and I won't read sort of what's here. Um, this is Alvin Bana and colleagues, um, and they've seen increases in self-reported adherence, um, but I think that these are kind of interesting interventions to think about and look at expanding. Um, and again, I think these types of interventions we can roll out into peer support groups and into things that are happening in the community, um, as opposed to just winging it and doing whatever in our sessions. Okay, I apologize, you can't read this. But so basically I started like Googling. I looked on Cypher, I looked on IAS, I went to UNAIDS. Um, this is actually AIDS Info, which is NIH, for adherence guidelines. Like what, what are we saying for young people? And I think the thing is it's common sense. Like the stuff that is here is not rocket science. And I think the practitioners in the room would probably say, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, like, the, the best, the evidence um, and the researchers, like, it's not there in clear sight saying we should be implementing this into clinics, at least from my perspective. You guys can disagree with me since I'm not a clinician. But just obvious things like establishing trust and mutually acceptable goals for care, um, identifying depression, low self-esteem, substance abuse, the thing that we talked about, that should be happening, family, friends, health team members, others who can support adherence working with the family to make plans for taking meds, establish readiness to take meds, okay? Um, then the things that we know, the clinicians know too, right? The simplest regime possible, reducing dosing frequency, um, consider the weekly and daily routines, choose the most palatable medicine, choose drugs with the fewest adverse events, like, okay, we can, we can do that. And then providing ongoing support, encouraging use of pillboxes and reminders, provide follow-up visits, provide access to support groups. So I think a lot of this stuff is happening, um, but maybe not all together or coordinated. So I guess Helen's point about very clear guidelines or recommendations, like it feels like we should, and maybe that's happening and coming from Cypher and other groups. But I definitely couldn't, it was not obvious when I looked for it. <laughs> so I think that, you know, having something for the region that can be a very clear, like this is what needs to be in clinics for young people um, is something that we should be thinking about. Okay, so just because who talked about, oh, and this morning talking about mobilization and thinking about community type of interventions. Um, so I guess just thinking again, a lot of our interventions are in clinics or even then in with family members, but what can we do in the community? Um, this is an intervention. Whoop that we're doing up in Bushbuck Ridge with an NGO called Sanke Gender Justice. And a colleague of mine at UCSF, Sherry Lipman, um, has actually created a theory of change, a conceptual framework about what is community mobilization from social change and social movements literature, um, from like sociology. She's done all the homework and kind of created, I'll show you, a framework. And we've taken the interventions that Sanke was doing, which were good, and really tried to then map them to the, to the theory of change. 
and think about like what, what pieces we're missing, what do we need to be strengthening. And so this intervention um, is actually around 90, 90, 90. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So about trying to increase testing, linkage, and retention and care using community mobilization. So if we think of the problems of low uptake, uptake a community driver, not, not I can't take my pill like right here, but what's happening at a community level, stigma, fear of disclosure, poor treatment literacy, clinic distance, gender norms, often dictating that you know men, we don't see men in the clinics because men are tough and they don't have to go there, um, lack of family support, why not maybe, social and structural barriers, so can a community come together mobilize for change and disrupt community and social processes that put these barriers in place. So this is um, a multi-group <laughs> intervention that we're doing up in Agincourt. SEMA is the name of the intervention, and in Shangan it means when people get together to plow the fields. So our community group came up with that. We're thinking the community is going to come together to take action and do something together. Um, and Right to Care is the PEPFAR partner in the area, so they've kind of been helping us with the clinic component of this. So this is the conceptual framework that we have, and so the idea that I said there are these social barriers to testing linkage and retention, so there's lack of community awareness about the benefits of testing and treatment. We are out there talking about treatment as prevention. Nobody had any idea what we were talking about. Nobody knows what treatment as prevention is. It was a very like novel concept that if you're virally suppressed, you won't um, transmit, or it's very unlikely to transmit to your partner. So how do we communicate this information to people? We've been working a lot with our mobilizers about messaging and literature, and how do we communicate 90, 90, 90 in a way that the community can um, engage with messages, but also with the clinic data. So we have a whole mechanism for feeding back actual data on their clinics about the proportion of their community that's testing, how many people are in treatment, how many people are suppressed, and really trying to get them to take ownership of that information and, and see progress over time. Gender norms that discourage men from engaging in care, um, stigma, lack of community support for testing, and fears around treatment side effects. Um, and then, so this is the mobilization model that the community has to have consciousness. They need to know what treatment as prevention is. They need to, like, be aware that, you know, what the guidelines are that, you know, you, you test and start. There needs to be a shared concern. There needs to be a sense in the community that this is important, that we need people to get onto treatment. We need people in our community to test. We also target leadership. So we work a lot with clinic leadership, with traditional leadership, um, and trying to tap into informal leadership in communities. We need to have collective activities, social cohesion where, the, where people come together, and that with organizations and networks to take action. And the idea is that hopefully at the end we can increase outcomes. And I'll just say we're in the field and we're doing this and we actively kind of are monitoring the cascade in these 10 clinics um, in this community of about 100,000 people. But I shouldn't like be dissing my own study, but I do wonder, you know, when we do these things, I think this is great and I think we will increase consciousness. I think that we will um, improve the community environment. I still think that unless we're addressing some of these structural barriers at the clinic, I mean, that's, we do these big events, people go and test and then they go to the clinic and they have to wait three hours and they don't. Like after two hours, they leave. They're like, I'm not, I don't have three hours to sit and wait to test for HIV at the clinic. So I think those are issues that, again, these multi-component pieces um, we need to be thinking about. But I think in terms of dealing with environment that this is a great model that an NGO in South Africa with people who don't have matric degrees are, are implementing and doing a great job. So for a way forward, again, I feel like I, I said this last time, but we need more of a bigger evidence base still, um, and I hope that that will change. Um, I think we, everyone in this room knows that adolescents aren't many adults. <laughs> I think that's been a clear, a clear message that they have unique needs. Um, I think another thing that we've heard is throughout the this meeting is that we need to think about adolescents' lives holistically and not just focus on HIV and treatment. We need to be thinking about career objectives, mental health, and other things going on um, in their lives that will allow them to become successful adults. Um, and we know things that can work in low- and middle-income countries. Are we implementing them? And I think we all know we're at this implementation science implementation phase. And so while we're doing this, the researcher in me says, please, good monitoring and evaluation, good documentation. So in three to five years, we can actually say what, what's working and what's not working and not just, again, have a black box.
So thank you. Hmm.